Good evening, I'm DK Rosner. Welcome back to the TTT News. The Gender Affairs Division recently invited interested persons to become national domestic hotline listeners. This evening, we look at the reason for a program like this and the experience of the course with lead facilitator Monique Augustin and a participant, Alicia Hospitalis. It's time for In Depth with me, DK Rosta. Welcome, Alicia Hospitalis and Monique Augustin. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for having us today. Our supreme pleasure. And I want to start off with you, please, Ms. Augustine, in terms of getting an overview of what the Domestic Violence Active Listener Training Program is about. So, the program actually took place from the 6th to the 10th of September, and it took place via Zoom. Now, the purpose of the training was to equip participants or the individuals with the tools and skills necessary to effectively offer that support and guidance to clients or callers that may contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So at the end of the program, we were hoping that the participants would be able to provide that listening and support and guidance for whether it be victims and or perpetrators of domestic violence, you know, to respond to emergency situations in an effective and timely fashion. So of course, being knowledgeable about the helping agencies and the functions that they perform with regard to the referrals and also the follow-ups that would be done by the hotline. So inform and educate persons when they call concerning whether it be physical, sexual, the different types of violence that takes place. And lastly, to ascertain the pertinent information that is needed for the purpose of documenting so that with the statistics, those things would then inform whatever programs the Office of the Prime Minister would endeavor. Now with a program like this, you said from the 6th to the 10th, uh, the program was put together. Naturally, there needs to be a gap or a need was seen. Uh, what would that need have looked like? Is it that they just want to raise capacity? You want to have more people? Or there's something else that was noticed towards having this program being implemented? So remember that Families in Action is just the person implementing it. But the Office of the Prime Minister, of course, I'm guessing they would have seen a need for it. Remember, with regard to active listeners, with regard to the skills that are needed, those things were seen as, hey, this is something that is needed in society, so let us put forth this program into the public domain. All right. Now, Alicia, you took part in the program. So let me get it from your experience, please. How was it for you? Okay. So first, DK, I want to say that I, I really commend the Office of the Prime Minister, Gender Affairs Division, for hosting this particular type of training um, for active listeners on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I also want to say high commendation to them for selecting the Families in Action as the facilitator, uh, Monique, and even the, her colleagues who supported her, they were extremely exceptional in the training that was given. So I highly, you know, commend the ministry and even families in action. Um, what I would say, DK, that um, as a participant, and I'm sure if you all had the opportunity to interview the other participants, they would tell you that the training was very, 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 very insightful. It was very engaging and very educational. And why I would say engaging is that, um, and the, so it's, um, I would say multiple learning methods were used. Um, for instance, we were taught, um, you know, Monique presented information, her colleagues supported her in the presentation of the information. But then there were, um, um, role playing, group work, simulations. And I think for me as a participant, the simulations is what actually um, concretized the information that was learned because it was a lot. You know, in four hours, four hours of being online and I would say being engaged, you know, in a, in a really exciting, informative way, I, um, as a participant, it really, really, really um, impacted me a great deal. And I could say that 
the simulations, I, I, let me give you an example. So the simulations were used to help us to, to um, I would say, go deeper in our learning, um, um, in our learning concerning domestic violence, the resources that are available, active listening. Um, so at some instances, some participants were asked to be um, victims and falling into the, the hotline and some participants were asked to be the active listener. And of course, being the active listener, you would have to demonstrate the skills that you had, that you, that we were taught, you know, how to, you know, to probe and how to summarize and how to give feedback, you know, um, how to be patient because I, I, I had the opportunity of actually being an active listener. And I could tell you, you know, when somebody is calling in and being flustered about the situation that they're going through, you know, um, expressing anger and, you know, being anxious, all at the same time, it's like a range of emotions just flooding this particular individual, trying to communicate with the active listener, the actual fear, the, the you know, the desperation to leave, the, you know, this, you know, just to communicate the situation, it really requires a lot of patience and, and attention because we have to pay attention to detail and when it made mention of um of the the active listener has has to be able to record right in detail you know so it's it, it's a skill as well that we practice through the simulations because we were able to you know take note of the situation and um the good thing about the training was that um we had persons who are active listeners on the helpline um, participating in the course. So they also were able to provide us critical feedback. So feedback, again, was one significant factor that um, we were provided on the spot. So that also helped our learning. And, and these, these active listeners were able to say, you know, well, where we went wrong, what needed to be strengthened, Right, um, so they were able to, to help us in our growth pattern, you know, I, 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 I don't know, it's, I've never really had this type of training and I, I'm really, really very blown <laughs> by the experience. And with regard to that type of training, I want to ask you what was your most interesting part of that training? We'll do that on the other side of the break though, but there are a few words that you used, you spoke about being able to record, having patience, engaging. Now, this is a lot to take place four hours, six to the 10th. But Monique, tell me though, we got some of the methodology, but what was some of the core concepts? You have about two minutes on this side, but what were some of the core concepts that you all would have tried to share with the participants of this course? Of course, core concepts would be, you are an active listener. So what is active listening? And as Alicia would have explained, she went into some of the skills of probing. How do you question? Um, a big thing is empathy. How do you exercise that in terms of a phone call? What do you say? Of course, we are living in Trinidad and Tobago. So a core concept has to be that of confidentiality and privacy. We need to stress that. Um, also, the client's right to self-determination. So it's not about what you want as a listener, what you think should happen. It is about informing that particular person going through with that and giving them the right to determine, you know what, this would be my next step. Um, also, safety planning was a core concept because you, if you stay in this particular situation, what can I do? If it is I'm leaving, how do I go about doing certain things? And it's not just about physical, it's also about safety planning of the mind. How do I go today, tomorrow? How do I assist my children? And also for the last one, you think about being non-judgmental. So that comes forward in terms of your tone and what do you see? And of course, most important is that of domestic violence or the concepts around it, you know, what may be some of the reasons that people may stay, um, what could be some of the effects of the cycle. Those were some of the core concepts that were taught to the participants. And we continue the conversation on the other side with the break. Monique Augustine and Alicia Hospitalis, we are talking about active listening. Uh, and uh, we get back into the conversation when we return. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We are speaking about active listening with regard to domestic violence, specifically lead facilitator for a recently concluded course, Monique Augustine, as well as a participant, Alicia Hospitalis. Now, Alicia, I asked and I, I, I told you I was going to ask you, but what was one of the most interesting things that you would have learned during this training session? So one of the most interesting things that I learned is that um, as an active listener, it's important for you to, to work with the domestic violence victim to establish a safety plan, right? Um, that one, I, I think, sung deep for me because, you know, I, um, I mentioned during the training that I lost a colleague, right, um, to domestic violence that happened I, in 2017, 2018. And, um, at that particular point in time, you know, I, you know, all of us, I, I think all our colleagues, all my other colleagues, they wondered, you know, what we could have done differently. We never knew, right? We never knew until after she did that she was a, a victim of domestic violence. Um, we, you know, so it's, it's sung deep in my heart, you know, um, if I had known, you know, I could have, you know, you know, discussed with her a safety plan um, it also um, helped me to, to reflect deeply on the importance of probing. You know, sometimes people may tell you about their situation. And as individuals, it's important to probe a little, you know, ask further questions, really try to understand their situation. And, and for me, in, in trying to understand the person's situation, I would discuss a safety plan. It's very, very, very important because um, you know, we were told, you know, and, and we went through the simulations with the different types of persons who will call into the hotline, um, those who are ready to leave, they want to leave like right now, um, those who not sure if they want to leave, and then those who don't want to leave at all. And uh, it's important for all categories to really um, talk through with the individual they need to establish the safety plan. And, you know, um, Monique highlights the fact that um, the client has the right to self-determination, right? It is not our role as active listeners or, or persons working with domestic violence victims to make a decision on behalf of the client. It is the client's responsibility. And I think those things really sound deeply with me that I am in no position to judge I am in no position to tell the client what to do. I'm really just simply there to provide information, to, to you know, to listen, listen, to listen, 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 because sometimes that's all they really need. As most times, if you know, I, in my background is in social work, right? And we were told that, you know, the client sometimes knows the answers. The, the majority of the time, they know the answer. They know what they have to do. And sometimes all they really need is somebody to listen. And then while that person is listening, they are saying to themselves, you know, this is what I need to do for myself. And let me and let me take from let me take one of the things that you were saying, please, Alicia, because you just said that your background is in social work. That begs the question, Monique, what are some of the things that you were looking at to say, okay, well, yes, this person is going to be part of this cohort that we take and build capacity in such a way. What were you looking for? Who were you looking for specifically? Well, DK, as I would have mentioned, Families in Action just facilitated it on behalf of the Office of the Prime Minister. So we worked with the group for their selection of persons for the training. All right, and is this something that you think would, would happen or should happen in your estimation on uh, a matter that is a little more ongoing? Because it's one thing to say, okay, well, yes, you have this set of skills. But at the same time, with a new set of skills, there may be things that you will want to brush upon a little more, uh, even learning how to deal with some of these things, because these issues can be triggering. So how do you deal with that going down the road? So as, is, as you would have mentioned, things that are triggering, yes, it has to be an ongoing thing. With regard to anyone, anyone who's just taken in the stress of listening to persons, and I'm, I am calling it stress, because remember the persons that would be on the hotline, persons are calling for good things, it's because they are in distress. So it's a matter of, yes, brushing up your skills, but also remembering that you are a person. 
So how do I deal with this when I'm in office or how do I deal with this as a person? And also remembering that you also have your life to live. How do I compartmentalize but yet remain human to what is happening? So yes, it has to be an ongoing thing. And I want everyone to remember that it's not just about you. People who are in the helping profession also need help. So I also would need a counselor. I need to, at the end of the day or a month or whatnot. You, you debrief with the people that are around you, but know that things are evolving. Unfortunately, these things are evolving and you would always need ongoing skills. It's like a textbook. Certain things, most of the text remains the same in terms of the principles, but there are revisions. So it's the same thing. You go forward with knowing that this is what is happening. How do I take care of myself as an active listener and then making those changes or those tweaks to the, the service that you are giving to the public? All right. And how many people were you helping to open that textbook for this time around? How many people were in the cohort? So there were 35, 35 participants in this particular cohort of training. Okay. 35. And Alicia, you said that you have this, this background in social work. I find that very interesting. And I know that you have provided service in a manner that is very, well, we say in the public life. Uh, that, yeah. The way that you would have looked back and said, okay, well, this is something that I may, if I had the skills, I would have been able to afford to my colleague. Are there other things that come and you say, okay, well, hmm, I could have addressed the situation a little differently like this. Or if I had this, I could have done it like that. Uh, were those things going through your mind as well when you were, when you were going through this process? I, I think there was just one instance when um, when I was um, the active listener, <laughs> and uh, I remember the the, the the victim being on the other end telling me about her situation. And prior to that, Monica just told us, "Don't ask the why questions. Don't ask the why questions." And my mind was literally racing at that particular point in time because thinking about the number of questions that I, I, I have to ask, uh, you know, um, to ensure that, you know, I'm able to capture because at that particular point in time, you're doing the recording aspect of the, the active listening, right? And, you know, to, to capture the information, I kept saying, don't ask the why questions. No, rephrase it, say it differently. And so that's another takeaway for me, you know, um, as, a, as an individual, you know, I, I would not, we, I will remember not to ask the why questions, but really phrase my questions differently that, you know, it doesn't come across in a way that is, you know, um, seemingly judgmental, or, but it really comes across as one that's empathetic and compassionate that really um, demonstrates to the, to the client that, you know, I, um, I care. I hear and I care. And I think that's what clients we really need to hear. Domestic violence victims really don't want anybody to judge them, but they really want somebody to say to them, yeah, listen, I, I care, I understand. I may not have experienced your situation, but based on what I'm saying to you, I understand. I empathize. I am here to advise you, to, to give you information more or less to provide you with information so that you can make an informed decision. And so that's what, you know, as a as a professional, you know, I would take away with me, you know, those those nuggets that really sinks deep, 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 deep within my heart. Really sinks deep within my heart. All right, so we want to thank you so much, ladies, Alicia Hospitalis and Monique Augustine, for giving us those points and I taking a lot of them uh, on, on my own in terms of like saying, okay, well, remember to brush up on this DKU. You're not asking those why questions. You're being empathetic, uh, confidentiality, and just making sure we do what it is we do in terms of active listening, in terms of helping where we can. And we want to thank you, ladies, as well as thanking you for tuning into In Depth with me, DK Ross. Now, on behalf of the entire GTT News team, thank you for joining us.